This is Plate Mark. My name is Anne Schaefer and I am your host. This is Plate Mark Series 2, A History of Western Prints. Today we're going to be looking at an artist named Claude Lorraine. Now Claude did not make prints. You may be surprised he's the topic of one of our episodes, but what he did do was establish a convention of landscape painting in France that had lasting effects into the future. He created at one point a book of drawings that were recording, each drawing recorded one of his landscape compositions in painting. An early catalog raisonné, if you will. Those designs were transformed into mezzotint prints that were published by John Boydell about a hundred years after Claude made them, and they became sort of a catalog of landscape styles and types. They had, as I said, a long-lasting effect, and it is for that reason that we are going to look at him today. True is going to take us on this journey, as usual, and I will let him do, do it. So buckle up and let's get moving. Well, hello. Well, hi there, Miss Anne. <laughs> Seems like it's been a while. Has it, though? I mean, we did something fairly recently. We talked about Claude Milan. Ah, okay, so it was... Yes. Near Easter. We did talk about Claude Milan. Hope you liked Claude Milan like we did. Woohoo! Well, oh, I want some right now today. I know. I can't find those moons anywhere. Yeah, well, I'll still take a, you know, an eBay. Something, something? Yeah. Or, you know, what about that St. Anthony, the Calo that I had my eye on? Oh, yeah, that would be good. Turning into quite the print slut here. <laughs> And you know what's what's really amazing about this podcast is that it's starting to have some repercussions because people occasionally say, hey, did you see this? And they'll send a link to something that's almost in my price range. <laughs> and then I'll go, want, 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 want. Yeah. So, hmm. so we're doing, what are we doing today? Well, apparently we're going to be talking about Claude Lorraine and the Liber Veritatis. Claude. Now... This is an interesting topic, and, and I can't remember if you suggested it. I think you did, because I would always ask for the Liber Veritatis. Well, that's true. The the several volumes of the Liber Veritatis that the BMA, the Baltimore Museum, has are falling apart. The binding is not very steady, so I was very afraid of bringing them out. For so the you students. never did. I that's think not I, true. Did we no, 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 never. No. Not to the studentos. Oh boy. I think I looked at it and I went. And yeah. He got kind of freaky, and that's well, okay. Yeah. I mean, there's enough other stuff. But <laughs> this Claude Lorraine, we got to talk about this guy because he's kind of interesting and he's one of these bizarre kind of dense facts. Mm. Which, uh, while I was sort of looking things up on this, they kept running into bizarre, quirky things that sort of are tangential, but not to this interesting individual. Kind of like. Claude Anything Milan, because he was kind yes, of quirky. And, yes, yeah, pretty um, much like that. And wait, he, oh, but before we go any further, we should sit down. Well, I am sitting. We're sitting in our positions. Uh, we, yes, we are. We're at the Purple Crayon Press. <laughs> we are on the... The land of the Piscataway Conway people. Mm-hmm. Yes, and uh, as for me, I identify as a cishet white woman, and I use the pronouns she, her. And as for moi, I identify as a gay, trans, white man who uses the pronouns he, him. All right. We've done it. All right. I'm sitting right here. All right. I'm doing my thing. Here we go. sticking to it. Okay. Let's try and put things in some kind of a context. One of the things I try to get across to my students is how connected absolutely everything is. Mm. And some of the things that we're talking about overlap in a huge way. We're starting at about 1600 and reminding ourselves about where etching has come from, our wonderful form of intaglio. I'm going to use Linda Holtz, a history prince in the Western world, as a guide here. That doesn't mean there aren't other reliable sources, but for the time being, let's just go with the thing that we've kind of been trusting for quite a little while. The idea of etching as an art form unto itself is kind of an exciting thing, and, and, and Paltz would remind us that etching had really started as a means of getting designs into armor, which were made of iron. And the idea was also then how to transfer those images eventually onto an iron plate, and then they realized, let's remember, poor Albrecht Dürer had tried to make six etchings on iron, hated it, mm-hmm. and then they kind of figured out how to use copper instead, and then improving more on the kinds of acids that would be used, and the thing about etching is that it is, it is I think, far more autographic, literally autographic, as in writing your signature, than engraving, which can be very painstaking, laborious, clean, crisp, clear, 
perfectly prone to rendering Renaissance classicism. And yet um, engraving does that, it doesn't mean it can't do other things. But when etching came along, as we talked about when we discussed Parmigianino and the mannerist concept of the more, more invenzione, the kind of invented image that is more spontaneously created, that's how along about mm, 1535, something like that, all the way through the 16th century, etching is continuing to improve and move upward and upward and upward if we think about it as a linear thing that moves up. Well, and when you say improvement, we're talking about improvements in the kind of acid they're using and the preparation of the plates Mm -hmm. and all of the sort of technical bits that haven't quite gotten firm. Yeah, I think the the thing that I I guess, I keep trying to reinstate in my students' mind the realization that none of this stuff existed and all of it had to be invented somehow. It's like, hey, why don't we quit using iron, which rusts, and let's use copper. It's more expensive, but we have to continue to get this thing and make it as flat as we can. Imagine what it would take to pound that all as flat as could possibly be and then be a durer and engrave into it. But the idea also of how to get your image in there, what kind of a mark would you use? Etching lends itself so much more readily to reflecting the artist's own particular mark. You know, the weight and the speed and the placement of how they're going to, you know, put those images onto the plate if it's going to be more like flourishes or stippling and hatching. And, you know, it's the mannerist kinds of ideas and marks that really become a good strong basis for the Italian Baroque style. I have to make a very strong case for separating it like the Northern Baroque which is Protestant, and it's not aristocratic, it's the Protestant, you know, middle-class Baroque versus the Catholic counter-Reformation Baroque. They're both at the same time, but it's, it's the Baroque era. If we were going to talk about a loosely say the Baroque era, usually is said to run from roughly 1600 to 1715. 1715 is late, it might seem, but that's when Louis XIV dies. Ah. And that's Mr. Versailles himself. Right. Now, I have three different uh, portraits of Louis XIV here to try and put into context just what the impact was of not only etching, but also of this ridiculous individual. <clears throat> I can say that I'm from Iowa. <laughs> and I wanted to remind all of us about the overlap here because the very first image I'm giving you, oh, what are they seeing, Anne? It says right there. Yeah, if you guys have been following along, you'll have seen all three of these images together before. The first is Claude Milan's portrait of Louis, the Louis the King before he's really the, well, he's the king, yeah. but he's not acting. But he's, his mom is acting as regent. Like 12 or something. I don't know. I think he might be more like 10. No, he's, maybe. he's youngish, but yeah. he's still obviously pretty powerful. Yeah. It's a marvelous little etching done by our friend Claude Milan. It's undated, but since he was born in 1638, let's say it's no later than done about, I would say no later than 1648. Yeah. And then the next thing you see is... Isn't that Udon? No. Oh, that's Bernini, right. It's the great Mr. B- I am Italian Ooh. Baroque himself. And Mr. Louis XIV Louis had summoned him to France and said, I want my portrait done. And so he did. And there are so many that would say that this portrait, this bust length portrait of Louis is the single most epic expression of what all things Baroque are. Oh, for sure. What it's that, that marble bust with the, the drapery that kind of flips off to the side. It kind of. In, it's in, wildly flourishing. In stone. <laughs> in marble, you know, and it's and, and haughty and wonderful. You know, the likeness of the face is there, but then it's surrounded by this leontine hair, and it's just remarkable. And then the last is a ridiculously huge painting that is by Yves Rigaud, and it was Louis XIV in... 1709. All three of these are giving us an indication of the pomp and the wild excess, let us say, of the Baroque era. And, and, the, and the power of portraiture. Absolutely. And that, yes, indeed. I mean, the power of portraiture, even to have this small etching of a king, you're not going to make an etching if you're only going to, here's your etching, just make one. It's something that gets out there. And so just the concept of the Baroque era being from 1600 to roughly 1715, and let's let the Rococo take on after that. I'm also trying to connect some dots. We're covering a time where, you know, you have Velázquez working in Spain, and uh, we have Caravaggio working in Rome, and we have... That just seems so... Bernini will come along, and he'll be bizarre. in Rome. Yeah. You know, and then you have 
Rembrandt up in, he was born in, in 1606. So these guys are all, let's say by 1650, they could all have been stumbling all over each other, but they're all in their different little aspects, but they're all giving visual life to the, the zeitgeist. And, and one of the things I try to give to my students when I'm teaching classes to talk about the new ways in the Baroque era of, of how space and time and light and motion are all dealt with in new ways as they hadn't been during the Renaissance. And so when we talk about space from the here to the hereafter, or we talk about that time would be static or it could be instantaneous and that kind of the sense of Louis XIV's cape, you know, billowing in the wind like that, that indicates not only time, but also motion. In the Baroque era, it seems like virtually everything is in motion. I don't think I can think of a single static image. It always implies uh, one frame in a series of actions. In, in a flow of movement. And it seems like a very appropriate follow-on to mannerism. It is, and that's exactly why on one day I, I finally dawned on me, it's like, oh, for duh, mannerism is the gateway drug to the Baroque. Right. It really is. Yeah. And say why. Well, so I feel like in the Renaissance we were concerned with accurately depicting form and perspective and all of that. And mannerism starts to take liberties and And then show off the virtuosity of the artist to emulate or not replicate but emulate the 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 great masters you know the the turtles and then it just keeps getting Michelangelo Leonardo oh sorry Donatello and the other guy Raphael thank you Raphael (laughs) (laughs) sorry mind fart it's it I never watched the show I I didn't either I used it because it was a good hook there for a couple decades well I think it makes sense for a lot of people um but it's like uh it's art is it seems like it's can can we and how do we depict how can we push it Mm -hmm. how can we add motion light whatever and then finally, when we get up to the 20th century, how do we break the plane, break. the picture plane apart? Oh. And then, and now what? Then we go to pure abstraction. And now what do we do? <laughs> Ideas, conceptual art. And then right? we have to get all postmodern and ironic. Right. Exactly. And, and, but it all makes sense because it's all about what happens to thinking about form and where we are as human beings. So the zeitgeist is really, you know, the spirit of the time is going to have everything to do with with how the art forms would be created. You know, when to say a guy is ahead of his time. I think it's a guy who's reacting to his time with more articulate ability than those around him. And it's like that others will latch on and say, oh, that's okay. That works for me. You know, it's like, hey, that Leo guy, he's got this anatomical thing. He's figured out some of this uh, perspective and all of those things. So let's talk about, let's say, mannerism and how it really loves that concept of the inventiveness and the, and the gestural sense and all of that being kind of the, the gateway drug for the Baroque style. But then... If we get to the end of the centuries, um, then let's start thinking about Barocci. And we've spoken about him before, that glorious St. Francis receiving the stigmata. And it is, it's a beautiful summation of what etching had become in, in the sparsity of wine, but also... Oh, he should have been on our top ten. Dang it! Well, that we can't have... Okay, <laughs> plug. <laughs> I don't know if this is where you want to do this, but at oh, some point... Oh, well, we should. So... Uh... At the end of the school year at MICA, a senior student named Leo approached True and said, hey, I'd like to pull a lithograph for you. Hey, you want to make a lithograph? I said, no, I don't do lithos. Right. So True hasn't done lithos since school. school, yeah. school. And there was a reason. Because, yeah, right. Because <laughs> it's flat. Right. It's full of the most, it's the most troubleshooting. Chemical. It's flat. You don't get to dig into wood, and you don't get to bite into a plate. It's just flat. You like the tactility. Absolutely. Okay. Well, fair enough. So, I mean, drawing is wonderful, but... Yes. So, what ended up happening is a, a print that summarizes and concatenates time in a history of prints timeline with the top 10 plus 1 images to to line up sort of the high points, the guideposts, as you go along the history of Western prints. Was the result. So Leo said, oh, you want to make it a lithium? I'm like, I'm not going to just do a drawing. It's got to be something that's got some meat and potatoes to it. And it's good. Okay, I tell you what. Since you didn't take History of Prince, Leo, I'm going to make, I didn't tell him until he saw it. I said, this is a History of Prince. And here is essentially 18 years of teaching History of Prince on one sheet of paper. It's like a scavenger hunt. 
And so Anne and I, over the course of time, had said, you know, what's in the top 10, top 20, and so on and so forth. And I try to get things to line up above and below the Alps and so on and so forth. And so um, we had come up with these things. And I, you know, like the perfect counterpoint to Palaiuolo's Battle of the Ten Nude Men would be... Martin Schongauer's The Torment of St. Anthony. Exactly, because both of those are the perfect right. summation of the Same North and time. South. Right. And then those all go, go into one guy, and that becomes Albrecht Dürer because he's the first guy that crosses the... Alps. The Alps. On foot. The Alps, the Alps, the Alps, the Alps. Several times. Many, well, twice at least. <laughs> Before, actually, down and back and down and back. Oh, boy. That's a lot. The lithograph got pulled in an edition of 32. Yep. And it is on True's website, thepurplecrayonpress.com. If you care to look at it, it's really kind of sweet. Well, Anne's got number seven. Of I do. It's my favorite number. No, well, you had to have that one. Yeah, I picked it. But yeah, so if you want to have a, a history of Prince <laughs> top ten, in parentheses, nine, eleven. All right, and <laughs> under the sort of series title, plate mark. <laughs> yes, of course. And the idea, of course, being that it starts with Gutenberg and the 42-line Bible, and it ends up with the World Wide Web. So it's this, this compression of time, and it, it's only a 30-inch wide piece of paper, so that's how come it yes. could be only 11. All right. We're thinking about the next one. So. Of course we are, because right. one of women artists will be there. Yes, there are no women in it. <clears throat> now, if we had longer paper and more time, we would have put in the Federico Barocci yes. of St. Francis receiving the stigmata, because it's just this beautiful summation of etching. I think it is a turning point in etching. Absolutely. Yeah. Students always fall for the Barocci, but it's just so spare and so light, and he's figured out timed biting, so he's got very faint lines bitten into the plate, and and then slightly stronger ones and much stronger ones, and some stippling and some dashes, and it's really exquisite. It's just so spontaneous and full of light and instant beauty, you know, there's the rapture of that one individual. And and, and Barocci is one of these artists that would also use etching to distribute the ideas of the painting he just finished because we also had that glorious you know the virgin you know it's oh the annunciation yeah yeah it's just it's just stunning yes. stuff and so it's, it shows that there can be the personal but also the public versions of, of etching you know whether it's for i don't know that saint francis receiving the stigmata certainly feels very personal it's almost so. as though he did Scale. it for himself it's very yeah, intimate small. and yet the you know annunciation is a is the patron side. Yeah, presentation it's, size. It is. It's yeah. a huge thing. So the idea of, of how all of those improvements add up gets us right to about almost 1600. And then the etching, because it is far more easily manipulated than engraving, it, it lends itself to so many more textural changes and the pressure and how long you can bite something and how many different kinds of things. They can be tonal. It could be spontaneous appearing. It could look incredibly laborious and nitpicky if it needed to. So it's it's really useful that way. And, and so you have Rembrandt, obviously, who's Mr. Etching himself, who can take etching from the incredibly sparse line to the incredibly heavily worked and dry pointed and dug into, which would be like a, the three crosses. And so that gets us to the point where I've always appreciated this conjecture of Linda Hulch, who said that, I'll use the word zenith, the apogee, the zenith of etching could be said to be in the 17th century. With Rembrandt. Of Rembrandt, yeah. north and south of the Alps. Okay. Whereas there would be those like, oh, it's the etching revival in the 19th century. Oh, wow. Well, it's not even a revival, really, because etching never really went away. It's right. just that it got even more accepted and wildly loved and then let's see there was the exactly and there was the establishment of the society of aqua tinters aqua fortists in 1862 and we get all these tasty guys that we're gonna have so much fun talking to you about you know in future weeks the 17th century was this extremely rich time for etching as well so and this is all before aqua tint was even invented in the 18th century so we have these delicious things and realizing that etchings, whether they were reproductive or original, were now actually starting to get into collector's cabinets on the same par as engravings. You know, for, for the longest time, it was engravings was the highest form and it was more important than woodcut. But now you have etchings that are responding to the new kind of interests that could be the, the coin of the realm of the day. So thinking about like the Karachi were very important brothers that were working down in Bologna with their little family academy and they did etchings. And you had 
Caravaggio, I found out he made one etching. What? I know. I've got to find out what it is. I got it. Like, where's the Caravaggio etching? I don't know. He did that. Guido Reni, who was a tremendously important painter, did it. Um, Giuseppe di Ribera. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Did a couple great ones. And I'll show you one in just a moment. The Spagnoletto, a little, little bitty guy that happened to study under Caravaggio in Rome and you know it's that that way of getting a genre treatment of all kinds of religious themes that get it out mm -hmm. to the people and then you know we we have another guy uh, Salvatore Rosa who is a very famous painter who also used etching as a way to get out his stormy crabby scary landscapes they're all you know filled with goblins and creepy bad guys and bandits as opposed to Claude Lorraine Yes, Claude. Claude. Yes. And Gillet, is that how we say that? Well, we just call him Claude. Everybody, well, He's Claude. alphabetized under C. Why? I don't right. know. Well, because Lorraine was the independent duchy. It wasn't French. That's not his last name. Yeah, and Gillet <laughs> was, like in G-E-L-E. -E Accent grave. Grave, E. So pronounced G-E-L-E. -E. Oh, Gillet. Gillet. Mm -hmm. So he was born in, we think he was born in 1600, Claude Gillet. Uh, in Lorraine, which was the independent duchy, but everybody calls him Claude here in America, but Claude if Claude, you were yeah. out in the world. And so, you know, we have so many artists working at the same time. I think erroneously, I think for the longest time, I thought, Claude Lorraine, he must be French. Well, he is Frenchish, and he's Frenchish at the same time as Poussin, or, ooh, Anne's right eye just went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which happens to us all the time because as Nicolas Poussin was You're kind of just a snooze well he's a snooze for us because it just doesn't resonate but he certainly had a following sure. and he had profound impact yeah, there's works by him in every collection well in indeed and you know it, 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 well if you're going to talk about you know Claude gets seven pages in Wikipedia and Poussin gets 17. You know? Oh, is that right? Oh, something ridiculous. Oh, wow. like, I'm like, I'm not printing it. I was actually going to do a comparison, <laughs> but I get so annoyed with, with how I was not getting revved up with Poussin. I mean, he did his fair share. They were both French people, French-ish people living in Rome. Both of them. Oh, interesting. And they must have known each other and had been sort of friends? They, they must have known each other at least somewhat. But they work in tremendously different ways, thank heaven. Uh, and, and so, <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to, to put that on our radar. So when I'm teaching art history, I really do try to get across these, these various things that sort of help the students lump ideas together. So we can talk about this the Baroque art concepts that I try to attack with space, time, light, and motion. But the other thing I do have to do, and we, we had discussed this in the past, but the concept of how... After the sack of Rome and then Luther nailing his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church, and this complete break that was coming about in Christendom was the Catholic Reformation. Yes, right. The idea of how are we going to come back, and you're, you're either going to do it through propaganda or perhaps persecution. But in terms <laughs> of, the Anne, can you tell them what I've, I've put together here? Four images that I think perfectly summarize the Baroque era. All of these are from Catholic Counter-Reformation right. artists. Churches, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, one of them is the, the St. Teresa in Ecstasy by Bernini, oh. which is a beautiful marble sculpture in a tiny little church in Rome. i got to go see that. I still haven't seen it. Oh, it's worth seeing. You have to put your you know, lira in there to get the lights on. Mm. And then the other one is... Well, there's a... Um, oh, it's a Caravaggio? Yeah. Caravaggio's Conversion of St. Paul. Oh, yeah, the conversion. Is that Tiepo, a Tiepolo ceiling? <laughs> Actually, no, that's a Pozzo. Pozzo? Yeah, if Fra Pozzo. <laughs> Never would have gotten that. I know, but it's, hey, it's totally Baroque. It's the, it's the, I'm failing my art history test right here, people. It's the Assumption of St. Francis. So here I'm showing Miss Anne four different images that I think summarize the Catholic Reformation, Counter-Reformation art. And so you were just telling us about how beautiful oh, yes. this St. Teresa in Ecstasy by Bernini is. <laughs> yeah, so the four images truth pulled together are the Bernini St. Teresa in Ecstasy, beautiful marble sculpture of a, a saint receiving the Cupid's She's arrow or something. stabbed with the fiery dart of God's love there by a go. Cupid, and it is essentially a religious orgasm. But absolutely. It and is, when you see it, you're like, that's no... <laughs> correct. That is and, not pretend. And, and here is this nun <laughs> floating on a cloud that's made out of stone. Right. But it looks like a cloud and being bathed by the light of, you know, holiness. Right. Top right corner is the much more down-to-earth, gritty, but 
equally entrancing. Caravaggio's Conversion of St. Paul. Yeah, from like 1601. And okay. it's ridiculous and gorgeous. And then there's another one on the opposite wall, which is, um, well, it shows how the artwork was in really intended to be site specific, you know, to understand how it would spill down into your space. And in some respects, we could talk about how prints, because they're handheld objects, they're also in your space. They are immediately in front of you. The last image is a ceiling painting, because what would life be without Baroque ceiling painting by Fra Pozzo? And it's a ridiculous painting, on the ceiling of San Ignazio in Rome. Oh, okay. And what it does was, it, it's just a barrel vaulted ceiling, but it appears to go up four stories as St. Oh, right. Ignatius of Loyola is being assumed into heaven. Well, so the whole point of the Reformation, the Catholic Reformation was to make everything as spectacular as possible to lure everybody back to the exactly. church. And so if you could connect the churches with heaven... And you could ascend through that beautiful the, the ceiling. here to hereafter, you just yeah. erase any of the unreality. So, you know, I give my, my students four buzzwords. And you would have to admit that all of these images are wildly theatrical, yes? Yes. I mean, there's nothing understated about it. Illusionistic, exactly. The trompe l'oeil quality of t assuming you clear into the heavens, you know, that the, the ceiling is blown off of the church or that the saint is falling directly at your feet. Emotional impact, there was no way you could receive any of these things with a cold heart. They're going to get under your skin, and, and that dramatic storytelling is the thing that's going to really lock in the desire of a lay person to go, wow, this Catholic church is such a glorious place to go. I've got to go there. And I had mentioned before, I still like the concept of how many Catholic churches were popping up across Rome and across all of the Catholic regions. So that idea was either by beauty or by fear. And, I, and I'm showing Anne one print, which is really quite remarkable, just to carry the thought across. Uh, that's beautifully emblematic of that gorgeous age of etching. This one is the martyr, okay, it's a long title, the Met gave it. Its, it's short name is the Martyrdom of St. Erasmus. <laughs> the entire Met title is the Martyrdom of St. Erasmus, who is prostrate having his innards removed to Puti above holding the crown and palm of martyrdom. <laughs> And this comes from 1630. Now, and this is Pietro Testa. Yes. But Piet this sure as heck looks like our friend Parmigianino. It kind of does, right? It, why, why do you say that? You're well, right. there's something about the, the sort of sketchiness, but the lightness of the ink color he's chosen mm -hmm. and the you know, that the guy's kind of laid out like Christ was being raised from the, the tomb. Yeah, and, and yet, this is actually, believe it or not, 100, 100 years, years later. Okay. You're so right about that, but this is even more vivid and graphic, you know, yes. because poor St. Erasmus, they're pulling his guts out in front of us. Yeah. They're making it as vivid as, as humanly possible, and even as he's wailing in pain and his gaunt body is being rent asunder, there are these two little chubby puto going, hey, you know, hang in there, pal, you're going to be in heaven soon. Uh, it, but it's just this kind of, well, the Spanish Inquisition thought of persecution if you are not true to the faith. So you have these two polar opposites, you know? Yeah, that's a great way to get people to stay. Absolutely. You're like, it, you're going to love it or you're going to die. Right. I also needed to remind you that as we talked about Jacques Callot, that's at exactly the same time. And those miseries and disasters of war were created as a response to this invasion of one Catholic country into another area that wants this and wants that. The grizzled new means of photojournalism, if you will, is what Calo gave us in, in 1633. And so when I show the students, you know, um, and it's in the top 10, by the way, of course. It's, it's the right hanging tree has yeah. to be in the top 10. Yes. But the concept of, of the power of prints is, you know, the, the size of this print is minuscule, but it was created in exactly the same time as this gorgeous... Peter Paul Rubens' The Consequences of War, which shows Venus going, no, no, don't go. Perfectly example of, a, of the uh, you know, flamboyant Baroque. And it's the exact same time as Velasquez's The Sender, Surrender at Breda. Both of these were images that were conveying exactly the, the concept of the time, either through mythological means or through actual historical events, how the Spanish, through their great organization, managed to defeat these this little ragtag group of Dutchmen who have to hand over the key to their city. But those are enormous history painting kinds of things. And yet the proportion, I love the fact that these huge ideas come in small packages, but I was very proud of myself when I gave myself this impact. <laughs> that the concept of, of how prints can't, you can't put that genie back in the bottle. And so, you know, having the ability to, to get the printed image out all over was tremendously important. 
So all of these ideas leading into the Baroque and the establishment of the French Academy of Fine Art, established in 1643, right when all of our big hotshot artists are working. It's reestablished by the time Louis comes of age in 1663. And by the way, Bernini designed a facade and nobody liked it, but they loved his uh, portrait bust. Oh, wow. Isn't that wild? But it's amazing that he's doing sculptures, architecture. In France. And he's like painting. All of that. Yeah. And composing and singing and writing poetry because right. he's like you do. Right. Because you know, he was essentially the Leonardo of the, of I, the I think I don't know enough about him. Yeah. It's the more you read about these guys, you know, the more interesting it gets. So the another incredibly important light of that French Baroque, or shall we say the Catholic Counter-Reformation Baroque, was Nicolas Poussin. And he was born in 1594 and he died in 1665. Now I'm showing Anne two very, very, very important paintings by Poussin, who is essentially a peer in time of Claude Lorraine. Right. And I'm showing you two images that are very important. painting by Poussin. It's called Et in Arcadia Ego. Thank goodness you know the title, because I blanked out. There in Arcadia once <laughs> dwelt I. Okay. And these two shepherds are, are looking at a tombstone, and it may have the name of someone they knew, and yet the figure of death is standing over them. They She's deaf with that yellow It might be rope? death. Yeah, she's not necessarily there. She's an emblematic figure. This is all very classicizing, dealing with, you know, mythology. That's not their mother looking at the no. tomb of their father? No. <laughs> Sorry. She's in a much higher class than there. Look at look at hierarchically, look how much bigger she is in there. Okay. That's okay, but notice how beautifully her drapery clings to her body. And Indeed. She's, very classical. And yeah. then it's St. John writing on the island of Patmos. Oh. He's writing, I th- believe, a gospel. Okay. So what do you think about these landscapes, Anne? Well, um... Is, do you think of them as landscapes? No, they they definitely are sm- smacking of history slash religious slash mythological paintings to me, set mm-hmm. in large landscapes for, the, I guess, the sake of demonstrating our prowess at painting landscapes that's always what it seems to me like yeah let's tuck a little something in there to legitimize it but um really i'm just going to show you how wonderfully i can paint trees and clouds well that's really an interesting way of putting it because the legitimizing of course it's mythological or it's biblical i look at these and they are air quotes perfectly composed my eye is led in there's a repoussoire element in the front that pushes our eye back and there's something that rounds all the corners and brings us towards the center of the painting and it has you know the full of classical references or temple bits or so on and so forth temple bits well okay ruins <laughs> but you know that that that, that Poussin was working in Rome as was Claude Lorraine, and they're both making these paintings with these very important classicizing kinds of titles. And by the way, Testa, the guy that just did the etching of, he was a pal of, of Poussin. Oh, anyway. interesting. So it just sort of makes sense that they'd be going after these, you know, very appropriate images. I think the thing that annoys me about Poussin is that it's just so damn proper. I don't, there's well, nothing that's... about them that, that ignites a flame in my being. They're calm, they're Are collected. Are they trying to calm society down in their way? It's the propriety of it, yeah. absolutely. Huh. So so we're not going to talk about Poussin for very long, but just to, to get across the idea of another, let's say, dichotomy of, of what the Baroque era could be. The academic Baroque, which were referred to as the Poussinists, oh, interesting. were the ones that wanted this kind of very classical, very crisp, clear, polished surfaces, no brush strokes show. To me, the skies always look like the postcards that are overcolored that were made in the 1960s. Yeah, Kodachrome. You know, and, and, and it just ding. The bottom <laughs> image is, is the Rubenists, the free Baroque, the ones that were letting the... the light space-time motion come alive and that the brush strokes showed and there was tons of action and activity. These are done at essentially the same time. They're these two strands, but both of these folks are, are working in a Catholic setting. Weird. Uh-huh. So it's sort of like, you know, the North and the South, you've got your Democrats and Republicans, shall we say. Right. What it also brings to light is like two strands that grow out of the... Renaissance, one of them is the Italian appreciation of disegno, that concept of the design and the underdrawing and the, all of the clarity and the pre-planning that goes into every painting. I mean, you'd set it up on a grid and you'd have it. 
in the top image Anne seeing is a Poussin painting of the rape of the Sabine women. And you can even see the quotations from certain sculptures. And the women, these big bulky women are going, no, don't, <laughs> stop, oh, no. <laughs> it's just everybody is posed and frozen. And in the bottom, again, you still have this Rubens where, you know, Venus is just really reaching for Mars and trying to keep him from running away. And it, you know, it's just yeah. everything is in motion. And Europa is just, you know, raising her arms and shrieking. And yet they're painted at the same time. And it's a perfect example of colorito, mm. that Venetian sense of, of activity and vibrancy and the senses, very sensual as opposed to the, the mind and the intellect, which is the, the academic Baroque. And so, you know, into that, you have to start thinking how much Poussin hated, just hated the Dutch art that was being made at the same time. What? Oh, yeah. You know, like those landscapes by Rembrandt. What? He thought of them as trash. What? Oh, they were unruly and they unpolished and they were dreadful. Oh, wow. Hated them. That's how come when I put this up for my students in class, I, I usually put the Rembrandt down low and it's like they're, the people in the painting are looking down like... <clears throat> <laughs> I, I do actually, you know, sell these kinds of an idea. These were done at exactly the same time. That's so bizarre. here you have this Rembrandt, and this is even a biblical scene of the, you know, so the, the Good Samaritan. Uh, but oh, there he is. Well, he's teeny. hiding on the. Right there. there he is. He's trying to help on the road, but most of this is well. What do you see? Landscape. Yeah, well, that's be a little bit more specific. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Well, there's there seems to be a rocky outcropping on the right where the Good Samaritan might be heading for the night, maybe, to camp. And it's smack in the middle is this little stand of trees. I don't know if it's little. That looks like a prim, uh, pretty... Oh, sorry. Cap. I think that tree's been through some battles. Look well, at that's it. true. It's a blasted tree, partially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a definite Dutch convention. And then there's a very light kind of valley floor in the middle ground so i guess the uh sun has hit it but behind it there's a storm coming through yep yeah now to completely throw these guys off i'm going to say if i were to cover up this good samaritan and i'd say this is mount katahdin 1830 <laughs> thomas cole sure you'd go oh son of a bitch so yeah. it is yes yeah for sure well okay so let's compare another one this is the one i always give them in class which is at the similar time all right so the dutch love of landscape was usually a way of portraying their own world. And so Poussin has got this completely imaginary classicizing landscape with our lovely Arcadian shepherds, you know, in the, in the antique times versus, let's say, Rustail's uh, view of Harlem at the bleaching grounds, which is an extraordinarily beautiful painting. What's at the, at the Moritz house in Harlem. What do you think of this particular landscape, Miss Anne? Well, it certainly looks like he's looked at clouds more carefully. Because the entirety of life up in the Netherlands is run by the sky, right? It's right. A, I always say it's a drip dry country, right? Because two thirds of this painting is sky. Because that storm is going to roll in off the North Sea and then it's going to pass and it's rolling past, rolling past. And it, three times a day, the weather is going to change, right? Right, right. And then you have the, the church, which is the heart of the city of Harlem, and then up close in front, in the bottom third of the painting, what are they? What are they showing us? Uh, it looks like they're. It doesn't look like they're working in the fields. It looks yeah, like they're, they're linen drying fields. Oh, linen. Okay. And they're laying them out, you know, in the sun. To oh, dry. I see. I see. And what's interesting too is that that Rosal is showing you how the sun has punctured through those heavy dark clouds, and in some spots is opening up into these areas. You can feel the damp moisture. You can almost sense the touch of salt in the air. It's just the the marvelous atmosphere of this. Far too naturalistic for the likes of Poussin. Well, so I guess that raises the question of what what painting is supposed to be and do. Well, there you have it. So the Academy, of which Poussin is going to be the Mr. Kingpin, you know, as they get their whole academic act together, he's going to be regarded as the one who has and doesn't says it all. But so, but the academies are started under the patronage of the king. But who's behind the push? It's really the French state. It is an extension of the French state. Okay. So uh, the French Academy of Painting and Sculpture was established in 1643, and they were getting it together, and then they reorganized it a little bit, but it's the Academy of Arts, of, of Painting, Sculpture, and Architecture. And it's run by, you know, this very august group of tight-gripped people that show it as an extension of the state. These academies, such as another big one, that would be the British Academy. 
And that was started in 1768. The part that blows my mind is that Benjamin West, an American, was one of the founders of that. But yep. the rest were all the Brits who were in the heart of their, you know, the portraiture phase. The Academy has this hierarchy, and it has always been thus, which, of course, at the top of the stack is history painting, and it could be biblical, mythological, or historical, as in actual events. And the next layer down would be portraiture, right? And it'd be just like, you know, the monarchy and then normal people, historical figures, and then, you know, us, maybe if we're lucky. And then the next layer down would be a landscape. The next one down would be... Still life, probably. Yeah, it's still life. Before genre. The genre is the, you know, what do the simple folk do? Right. It's genre is at the bitty, bitty, bit bottom. I think genre has always been a term that's confused me, just to clarify for listeners who haven't sat through as many art history classes as us. Basically, it's images that portray normal daily life daily and life. tasks. Absolutely. Now, if you go, if you teach art history to music schools such as I do, then they'll say it's a type of music. So the, the genre is, well, it's, these are symphonies or these are operas. Oh, right. It's a kind of thing. But in art, we refer to it as scenes from everyday life. Right. But it is the simple folk, right? Right. right. So the idea is that, of course, in the Dutch Republic, the Dutch Republic which is not aristocratic. They're proud of the land. They have wrested from these attackers who want to try and make them back into Catholics. And, and so, you know, these portraits of the land that they have won is a very endearing thing. And these kinds of portraits of the land will be in the home. Well, and they're enjoying a serious rise in the middle classes oh and God. serious wealth. And isn't, the yeah. tu- isn't this the tulip? Yes, it's tulipomania. It's the golden age of, the, of Holland. And right, so they're portraying their largesse and their mm-hmm. their ability to rise without, without royal yes, without s- support. Be, exactly. So, you know, remember, you will die. You know, all those mm-hmm. memento mori still lives that will let you know that time is fleeting and that things in good life should be enjoyed but don't you think that you're better than anything death will come and get you so you always have this kind of pragmatic sense of the good fortune that you're experiencing when we think back to Poussin and he's looking back to the renaissance and he's looking to things like Raphael or he's looking to the coloristic or the the kind of Arcadia that Titian would have exemplified we have these very proper images but what's really always interesting if you ever google an analysis of a painting, you're going to see some really <laughs> astonishing rules and numbers that get yeah. placed into them. And and here are just two that I use in class, that, and I'll put them up there for you. But just noticing how things are degrees of an angle, or that they're arranged on the concept of the golden mean, which we mentioned before and we'll mention again, which is that concept of this this imperfect balance of opposites. Poussin is just, it's so calculated. I think it's, it's so close to perfection that it's ice cold to me. I agree with you. At the same time, we get Claude Lorraine, who was born in 1600 or maybe 1604 or 5, and he dies in 1682. Either way, that's a very long sure lifetime. Is. And what you have in front of you, Miss Anne, what do you think? Well, it's a self a purported self portrait. I assume it's a self portrait. And he's looking, it's looking sort of um, Velasquez ish. Yes, he is, isn't yes, he? Very well, sort of dark and Spanish. Kind of wonderful, and he's got that wide look. If he it looks like he cut the Van Dyke beard part yes, he's off, got a but little, he's got the he's got a little soul patch there. He, but he still has the uh, <laughs> Van Dyke mustache. It really gives us that sense that all of these fellows we've been talking—they're all living at the same time, and they're all you know trying to figure out slaves what, to fashion. Indeed. <laughs> now, if you wanted to see what he, <laughs> that was great. <laughs> oh what is that? Well, it's a portrait of Claude Lorraine. <laughs> Oh my heaven. Which was done in mezzotint as the frontispiece for the Liber Veritatis <laughs> when it was published a oh, century later. That's an unfortunate portrait. Well, I thought you'd enjoy this comparison, you know, Oof. how we see ourselves and how others see us. Woof. Or how others reinterpreted our self portrait at the front of our book in mezzotint. Yikes. Um, I just thought I'd point out to you who made this happen. Well, oh, okay, so, yeah, so Boydell had, had said, I want this published, and he has Earlham do the actual mezzotinting. So, you know, 1777, it's, it's 100 years later, and yeah. somehow he, time and mezzotint Ooh. have not been kind to him. Well, it's bizarre, because Earlham's a pretty smart... Well, exactly. ...and good artist. Anyway. But let's remember... We'll get there later. When we think about Poussin versus Claude Lorraine, when I show a Poussin on a screen, also a Poussin, and the students are like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, because it's a three-hour course in the dark. And then I pop a Claude Lorraine up there, and their little eyes go, boing, and they pop right open. 
And and why might they just get totally excited about a painting that pops up like this? Okay, well, now we've got a Claude painting of the embarkation of the Queen of Sheba from 1648 on the screen. And it's, by the way, it's five feet tall yeah. and six feet wide. You it's... know, six feet, well, six and a half feet wide, which is constable. Those six footers. Hmm. Oh, I wonder if there's that? a connection. Yeah, probably. Hmm. I'm sure Constable hmm. is looking at him. Mm-hmm. We'll get there too. Um, yeah, so this is a one of those wonderfully um, Arcadian harbor scenes with a setting sun and some ships leaving harbor. And there's sort of temple ruins framing the image on the left and then a building on the right that must be, I don't know, some the customs duty house or something. A really very classical customs duty house. Very much so. Considering Queen of Sheba is not exactly from there, but that's okay. <laughs> right? So she's embarking or what have you. They're packing her stuff into these little dinghies and they're going to take them and put them on the big boat. Okay. So it's a pretty dramatic image. I want for you to realize that these paintings, they glow from within. And that's the thing. That is the thing that Claude Lorraine does differently than anybody oh, else. Interesting. Because landscape art has been coming up over time. And Claude Lorraine has a a fairly interesting way of getting himself known. So just as a a brief reminder, he grew up in Lorraine, but his parents died when he was just 12. Yeah, so he had to go live with his brother, Jean, who apprenticed him for a little bit. Then he decided to go live most of his life in Italy. He was one of the few that was going to be concentrating on landscape paintings. But if you were to see this painting, And it's just a harbor scene. I would never say Sheba. Right. No. So if it was a harbor scene, then it would probably just be a landscape or a seascape. Right. But because it's the embarkation of the Queen of Sheba, Mm -hmm. it rises rises in the hierarchy. Exactly. So by the 1630s, he has really established himself as the leading landscape artist in Italy. He is essentially called like the leader of the Roman school of painters. Even though they're, air quotes, Frenchmen in Italy, it's this Roman school. And the patrons were almost all Italian. Oh, interesting. This is the, you're right, this is the first time we've seen somebody paying attention to light like that but it's something that of course Turner and the Impressionists will pick up hmm um, I wonder why after his death he became very popular with English collectors and the UK retains the highest proportion uh, of his work I have no doubt hmm uh, how do you suppose <laughs> I wonder so the thing that takes us to that step is that he was incredibly busy with pen and ink he drew constantly in oh. fact he owned most of his drawings when he died but you know that's practicing it could be preparation sketches they could be presentations drawings if you want well and at that point you weren't selling off your sketches correct like that. you would only sell presentation drawings. correct the, the things that are ready but here's the deal he's one of the very very first to sketch on site what yeah do we know uh, that yes we do because he told his biographer baldinucci Ooh, right before he died he has two biographers there's one who knew him younger and actually lived with him and then there's another one baldinucci who talked with him when he was older um but they both remarked that he would talk about sitting out and he actually did believe it or not oil sketches oh wow on site en plein air i bet those are great I, so that's the kind of a thing that we don't hear of it, until the 19th century. No we're talking about Mie and Corot and all those Possible. boys and Barbies. On. Exactly. There's some things that he is quite influential with and, and very innovative. And just so you know, he did do 40 to 50 etchings of his own. He did etchings of his own work. So. Yes, so finally circling around a prince. So we had to get there because <laughs> it's important. So, oh, and another thing I needed to tell you. When he did go down to Rome to start learning... The person that he was spending the most time was in the. This is gonna. This is gonna get your doors like blown off. He worked in the workshop of Agostino Tassi in Rome. Now, according to Sandrart, who was his first biographer, at some point he went down to Rome, was working as a cook for Agostino Tassi, who eventually said, "Wait a minute, why don't you just come and be a painter?" And pulls him over to do that. Hmm. And converted him into an apprentice and taught him drawing and painting. Now get ready. <clears throat> okay. While Tassi, known as the rapist of Artemisia Gentileschi, I'm sorry, had a large workshop specializing in frescoes and schemes of palaces, and just went face palm. Oh. Uh huh. Oh. So it's a small world. Yeah. <laughs> like, so Claude Lorraine's 
mentor final teacher was yeah. the rapist of Artemisia Gentileschi who was the most renowned Caravaggisti working she had absorbed all of Caravaggio's style and worked well into the 1630s and we know because she took him to trial it's an amazing thing so get out your little biographies and start finding out about this amazing woman artist oh. I know I went whoa <laughs> I, 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 I know but there you have it. So he's working with Tassi for probably three years. And, and he had also traveled. He got to Marseille and Genoa and Venice. And he studied nature in France and Italy. But he really did settle back down in Italy because he really loved that Campania. He loved the Italian countryside. And that's where he was doing these studies on the spot. I think that's where he picks up his ability to really have that sensitivity for atmosphere and light and that, that sensual quality. The colorito of of the landscape as opposed to the disegno, you know. Well, Poussin is busy making stage sets. They look like stage sets. Yeah. Claude Lorraine <laughs> will be doing these kinds of things that just really do adore nature. He happens to populate them with classicizing elements. But it's it, an excuse. You cannot make a sky and a sea look like that without having really looked at it. Yes. Do we think that, and I'm sure somebody has done work on this because people Why don't, <laughs> yes. do we think that he's using a different under color to enable that light to come through? That's a great question. If I were a painter, I would probably be able to tell you more about, you know, yeah. did, he, did he use gesso? What did he, did he do a monochrome it's you know, brown like sketch sort of under? Yeah, yeah. Brown. But there's something that just infuses these things with light in such an amazing way. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, he suffered from gout. And so when he was about 63 years old, he had a very terrible passage in his life, but he managed to recuperate from that and kept painting until 1682. Wow. And apparently his last painting is kind of scary looking, but hey, that's what happens when you're 80. So get <laughs> off his back. Okay, fine. When he died, he says, it says here, he, he only owned four of his own paintings, but he had all of his drawings. Hmm. And the most important of his possessions was his Liber Veritatis. Yes! The most important of his possessions. Wow. Hmm. Wow. Now, where would that take us? <laughs> the other thing I want to point out to you right here, Miss Anne, as okay. we've been looking at the embarkation of the Queen of Sheba, is that it had been in the collection of a guy. It was eventually given to the British state. Uh, Turner said that when Turner gave his gift to the state, that they could only have it if they would hang his paintings, Turner's, next to Claude's. Oh, right. I'd forgotten that. And it makes so much sense. Yeah, yeah, doesn't it? of course. Now, when I was sort of beefing about Poussin and saying he's Mr. Math, well, there is this golden mean, this lovely 1 to 1.618 kind of concept of these, these shapes, that the balance that you'll see. And so I set up... Can you describe the golden mean a little bit more? Hate to be. Sorry. Well, after we've talked about no, it no, the last no. time, someone it's fine. It's fine. emailed me and said, I know, right what here, are you right talking here, right, about? Right so the golden mean or the golden ratio had been around since ancient Greece. And it is the, the single most irrational number. One plus the square root of five divided by two. Mm -hmm. um, and it is... It, Oh, that's right. It's the, the Greek letter phi oh, is what right. denotes it. And so it's really mysterious and lovely and wonderful, but it is equal to 1.168. And that peculiar, it's used in the Parthenon in terms of proportions of the facade. It's used in the proportions of the most beautiful human faces. They've done computer algorithms where they set up the proportions of the eyes to the nose, and it is like 1 to 1.618. It's this peculiar way of dividing... A horizon line in fifths or some such thing but it's not like dividing the square in half and half and half to get the well, that, nautilus shell it, it gives you the fibonacci sequence as well right so there are many different kinds of um, diagrams we could give you the one i chose was this one because it pretty much shows the horizon line and the vertical that um that you'll see, see in Claude's, but it is also exactly that beautiful Nautilus shell. Right. Um, it was Bob Benitez who had written to you and said, hey, what is this golden mean thing? And you sent him back the most beautiful comparison. I did. And it was a Milan. Yes, yeah, so it was and, the Moses and the burning bush. And it, it matches up beautifully. I was like, where the heck did you, that was brilliant. And Thank you so much. I probably should uh, include that. All right, I will. Because it's really a stunning way to illustrate it. It so, was a good 
we're not mathematicians, but we know what we <laughs> what we see. Well, that just brings up the entire point of what why this is so powerful. Because sure, there's a mathematical something or other there, but in yeah. the end, it's something that is just um, comfortable for human right. eyes. For instance, like if you're going to make a still life, you're going to do it with an odd number of objects, not an even number. Mm-hmm. You know, this three is going to be more pleasing to see than two or five things as opposed to four. This thing, it's a, it's a marvelous division of space and there's something really miraculous about it because it continues. It is so irrational that it can continue to go in on itself and in on itself and in on itself. So the Fibonacci sequence is seen in nautilus shells and in certain kinds of plants as they're unfurling. And it's used in all kinds of medallions and the designs of lots of logos, including the phi that you see in, let's say, the School of Athens or the phi that is the shape of the mandorla of Johns Hopkins University or the mandorla around Christ at Vesle. It is eerie how much it appears, and it's it's like this humming, thorough, pedal tone of beauty that exists. I think. Wow, it, well said. Ooh, thanks. Humming, th- say that again. I don't know. You'll have to run the tape back. Oh my it. gosh! But it's that it's the pedal tone. It's just there. It's present, and it kind of holds the whole picture together. So here, Anne, is something I devised for my class. <laughs> There's a diagram of you know one of the many Claude paintings. And then there's the Queen of Sheba, and you could use the same proportion, you could drop it on there, or even on a landscape, which has not got a flat horizon line, but it does, and they're all still there. That, you know, they could say that it's, you know, someone say it's a grid, and it's divided by triangles. It's, no, it's not. That's the golden me. It's the golden ratio. Just, just admit it, and, you know, <laughs> no, no and then you have it. So with that said, I wanted to, to get that across, you know, that we have... Um, Claude making these glorious landscapes, Poussin would, air quotes, improve on nature. Mm. That tends to be a French thing that you'll see a lot, like at Versailles, where it's like, we're going to improve nature, you're going to have the manicured gardens, you're going to have the one mile long lake, you're going to have these gardens up close, all these different, you know, topiaries and whatnot, and it eases as it gets further and further out into the wilds. Well, with Claude, it's always going to be these kind of sunny, it's almost like Matisse. It's just always sunny and pleasant and pastoral, and there's nothing fearful and unpleasant about it. Um, it's going to have mythology. It's going to have religion in it. It's going to have literature. It could even be a genre scene, but it'll keep it from being pure landscape because that would just be below the par. Right. You know, because he's regarded as the leader of that. So yes, a grid of median and diagonal lines. No, it's the goal. <laughs> Just let's let's get real there. Right. All right. So the other thing I wanted to bring to your attention before we actually look a little bit more closely at some things is that <laughs> I love this. Um well here's here's a comparison right off the bat. Here's a landscape with country dance. This is a sixteen thirty seven image that's at the Uffizi. And this is Claude's painting of it, and on the right-hand side you see Claude's etching of it. And of course, it is what? It's the mirror. It's exactly the mirror image. If we go in super close, eventually you'll start noticing that they're almost invariably populated by figures. Well, that's an interesting thing, because those shepherds or those you know gods or whatever, I wanted to bring to your attention that... Um, <laughs> initially, Claude often includes more figures than was typical of his predecessors. <laughs> Despite, as Roger Fry said, <laughs> that's the great art the critic from the 1900 time who gave the gave us the term post-impressionism. Fry had recognized his figures as notoriously feeble. What? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it cracks me up. Um, and so, and and then. It goes on to say that the figures were mere genre staffage, shepherds, oh, travelers, staffage. and sailors, sure. appropriate for the scene. Well, there's another quote at one point where Claude would say, he charged so much for the landscape, but he throws in the figures for free because he <laughs> even knew that his figures, he was trying to get them better, but you know, the figures are free. Oh, funny. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Because, you know, we all have our own quirks. But you can imagine somebody like Claude who's doing all of these beautiful, glorious, you mm-hmm. know, seascapes and landscapes would probably have in those bazillions of drawings of his a little catalog book of figures, Staffage. Staffage. Staffage, you know, <laughs> to just throw in there. Like, a little bit. Especially if he's not particularly interested or good at them. Well, and here's the other thing. So here we have a, a, a wonderful etching of the landscape, a with a rising sun. 
right? One and of here, many. Good and luck here, finding and it. here's the painting of it. <laughs> well, no, that one's at the Met. Okay, good. But but I wanted for you to be able to compare them again to just see that, you know, when you're doing an image in etching, you've got a point. You know, you're drawing with the precision, not just dabbing paint on. And uh, yeah, I would think that if you're etching some things, you you would need to clarify that for yourself a little. I know that I struggle. I kind of muck up things and I have to try and erase them and whatnot. But it, but let's not pay attention to that. Let's just look at this beautiful mirror image of his harbor view with, you know, sun. And you can see, you know, genre workers down there, the staffage down in the front. And the other thing that makes him kind of unique is how he's not going from the same kind of playbook that Poussin was. Uh, Claude just sort of says, here's a little classical thing here, a little classical thing there. Here's some Corinthian columns that happen to be existing at the same time as the Queen of Sheba. And oh, look, the boat that just sailed in, that came from the 16th century. But that's okay, because that's what I'm looking at. But don't you worry about it, because it's gorgeous. <laughs> and look at that sun. And everybody's going to go, okay, <laughs> because it's freaking gorgeous. And, and you know, he has really remarkable clients. So... You know, you can put in your, your various characters. You can put them in pastoral dress. Eventually, they stop wearing genre clothing, and they start wearing pastoral dress, which mm. was, let's all be shepherds and shepherdesses that don't stink, which is the beautiful thing we're going to play at, pretending that we're in ancient Arcadia or, you know, that kind of thing. Now, all of these gorgeous paintings that he'd been doing, I, this brings us to the Liber Veritatis, and Anne's fight. finally, you're finally there. <laughs> We've been, we've been giving you the lay of the land of the Baroque, post-Baroque, uh, sort of. Well, Baroque, the heart of the Baroque. The heart, okay, heart of the Baroque. And we have come to Claude Lorrain and his uh, output of prints in a manner of something called the Liber Veritatis. So just as a, 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 a little fetching gimme, one of the things, because his work had become so popular, uh, this Italianate form of making landscapes, despite the fact that he and Poussin were kind of Frenchmen, but not really. They're living in Rome. They're doing the whole thing. Believe it or not, there were these Italianate landscapes that were being collected by Dutch collectors, but those were always the richity rich, like the Burgomasters, the ones at the higher level, and you can see them in their collections. But the neat thing was that the etchings of all the Italian scenes were the things that the middle class were collecting. Oh, interesting. So there was even a taste for this Italian kind of, because the, the etchings get north, and it's a marvelous coin of the realm. We have never used the word Italianate before. Stuff that was spanked of Italy and its countryside <laughs> and its architecture? Yes, but, I mean, it's, it describes a certain way of composing a scene, yeah. particularly in landscape, you know, framing elements, leading, a your, leading your eye back, you know, middle ground, foreground, blah, blah, blah. And it's a, something that art historians call Italianate. So it's just really a... Formulaic. Formulaic way of putting together a landscape. Basically, just look at any Poussin. Exactly. Now, if you want to look at Italianate landscape done by Claude, then you get to have foreground, middle ground, background, freaking gorgeous sunshine! Or, and he would, oh, by the way, when he would paint outdoors, it was usually towards sunset or towards sunrise because that was that magical crepuscular thing that he managed to capture. And, you know, Poussin is going to give you, like, this sky is blue, the trees are brown. But, but Claude is going to let that light affect every surface in the painting. And that's one of the things that makes him so remarkable. One of the things, because he had become so well regarded and he was being collected by cardinals and even Pope Maffeo Barberini had four of his paintings. The Pope owned oh. four Claude Lorraine paintings. Wow. That, I mean, he was in the high echelon. He started keeping track of everything he made and he would do a sketch of the painting that he had finished or a sketch of the painting as he was working on it and so the Liber Veritatis is what he eventually called it but it was actually a book that he kept together between 1635 and his death in 1682 and it contained initially at least 195 drawings of all of paintings done by him so it is his visual record of his own work. It was for him initially. It was just for him. And so, you know, when he died, it eventually becomes the property of the Dukes of Devonshire. And it's now in the British Museum. Well. Of the book that is the drawings themselves. The book of the actual drawings right. by the Dukes of Devonshire. And it is the book, the actual original drawings book. Of, and the Liber Veritatis means the book of truth. 
Well, yeah, it's like his own catalog, Raisin A. Exactly, yeah. which yeah. he is like the only artist that we can really, I mean, so very rare, and particularly as thorough as he was and complete and as well recorded, it's an incredibly wonderful gift for scholars and, and so on. So it was in the 18th century, as these kinds of things start becoming more and more important, people are, ooh, landscape is neat. It is reproduced in print from between 1774 and 1777, as we had mentioned by Richard Earlham. So, a hundred years later. Yeah, like a hundred years after, essentially after his death. The Dukes of Devonshire hire Earlham to produce it, or Boydell. does somebody, Boydell, of mm -hmm. course. And, and so, once this has gone into print, it's so incredibly influential in terms of landscape painting, and that's why the British landscape art, it's Boydell, it's London, it's all of those things, right? And so, you know, what they had to do in all of the, in the original paintings by Claude, it was, you know, he used pen and watercolor and sometimes a little bit of brown or gray to create these, these records of the paintings he'd done. And sometimes they'd be done on white paper, sometimes on blue paper, but they were all bound together later in his life. They're usually about seven and a half by 10 inches. He began with that self-portrait, that scary one that you went, <laughs> and you saw it. And each painting had a, a page, and on the back it would say, you know, what it was of. It had a reference number, his signature, the name of the patron, and where they were located. Oh and even sometimes a note about the subject. Now, so many sources say that he was unlettered, but I want to know how he knew all about, like, the Asses of Phocion, or how he knew about the entrance of the Queen of Sheba, or how Higley had his wife did a... <laughs> What? Where is he getting this stuff? I mean... Wait, they say that he's not learned? Yeah. Oh, interesting. He's unlettered. Um, and so the thing was that said he really did keep... Very... A genteel way of saying it. Yeah, I know. Well, unlettered. Un unlettered, you can tell it was a British kind of a... a you know. Um, and so the idea was that it had 195. Eventually, they goosed it up to like 200 have make it even. Um, and so there, were, there was even an index in it that Claude Lorraine had made himself at the back of it, and then what was rebound with a couple more pages added, there was a second index added, as they do. But that's the whole point, was to have this, this record of an artist is so great. So, the Book of Truth um, is, is really that um, Claude told his biographer, I kept this record because I didn't want, I wanted to be able to say, no, I did that painting, no, you can't say that you did that one or that it's by me, and he would used it as a catalog raisonné to prove the validity of the paintings, because there was enough of that going on, you know, emulating him. And in some respects, yeah. it kind of reminds me of what, um, how um, Hogarth like stopped doing anything for a while because he had become, his work had become so popular, there were so many people copying it until he managed to get the copyright law passed. And once that happened, they could put his copyright on his stuff. You know, this is like an early form of, of protecting your intellectual property, which I just think um, is really neat. So when you consider the fact that you've got almost 50 years of drawings in this, in this book of sketches that he's doing. You know, you can see how it starts off simpler and then it gets more and more elaborate. And well, and it's kind of astonishing how many variations there can be in landscape. I, I know, right? I could Unless like, well, Philip Perlstein. I mean, uh, nude yes. women, carpet, and a neat chair. Right. Okay, Philip Perlstein, two women, <laughs> two dude women. Well, that's why the titles are all very descriptive, like you read from the Met, like, yeah. yeah, or let's. It's the too puto over the shoulder. Of exactly, the, yeah. and as, and so the students were like, "Did he name it that?" And I said, "I'm sure they did." No, he did not. But, no, but so th here's a funny thing. Also, here he's protecting his intellectual property. Well, he's got this book that's like seven and a half by ten, and so when he does the drawings of them, he adjusts the drawings to fit the aspect ratio of the paper he's drawing on. So sometimes they'll be squished and sometimes <laughs> they'll be stretched. I'm like, what are you, a computer? <laughs> you know, like reformat, but they'll still be, you know, they'll be there. So, um, and then the, the, it's like, well, there are paintings by Claude that aren't in that book. So how can they be true? Because when he did a second version of a painting, he wouldn't include it. Mm. And we know, you know, like Berkeley and the Isle of the Dead, um, certain artists just kept painting their big, like Watson and the Shark. There's two of those. So he didn't include those. Um, and here's another quirky thing. In his will, it's a bird. It might be In a his will, he left his most cherished object, which was his Liber Veritatis, the sketches of everything he'd ever done. He left it to his adopted daughter, Agnes. Hmm. However, hmm. it seems as though Agnes was actually his actual daughter by a servant. Hmm. Because Claude never married. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Always interesting. Um, and so once the book is published, you know, it becomes so much more accessible and it's published in London. And so it just... <coughs> has everything to do with the way English landscape painting just took off, like crazed. And so a tremendous revelation. Um, and the other thing was because it had stayed in the Devonshire collection and nobody could get it, they're like in perfect. Oh, I bet. They're just like pristine and, yeah. and perfect and lovely. And then here's the last little tidbit. It was given <laughs> as, as a, a settlement of inheritance tax. <laughs> The ninth Duke of Devonshire had to give it to oh. the British Museum oops. to pay off a oops debt. Oops. And here's the worst. What's that last line say there, Miss Anne? Dissemb ah! mm -hmm. Dissembled in the 1970s. Pages are mounted individually and lent to various exhibitions. Ay, ay, ay. I know. That's like when they started dismembering, uh, dismembering all the, the birds of North America. Yes. So it's supposed to be in four volumes, you twit. Yes. So there's that kind of fun thing. Okay. So... Now you all know, no, you tell us why you know about Boydell. Oh, he just, when you're looking at um, prints from this era in England, he's the publisher of almost every one of them. Yeah, he's like the big cheese. He he's just, everywhere. He knows who to pick. Hey, yes. will you do a such and such for me? And he hires Earlham and he says, hey, you leading printmaker, I want you to do these, um, uh, these mesitants after this, you know, all 200 of them. And so it's published in two volumes. In theory, I believe the, the 200 that are the original Liber Veritatis are in the first volume, and then a bunch of other Claude drawings are done in the second. Um, of course, I haven't seen them because they were in such poor state of repair. Well, it was okay, scary. It's okay. Like the, the leather <laughs> binding was like crumbling in your hand. So it's sort of like as special as it was when it was in the Duke of Devonshire's right. collection. It was, right? it was scary. No can see. No, no. It's okay. No, no touche pas. Um, because now we've got the internet. Mm -hmm. So um, so the way they would go about this was um, um, Erlen would, would use etched lines to get the, the, the pen lines of... of Claude, and then he would use mezzotint to get the tones and the washes, and it gave you these really good, crisp impressions of the of the original images. It was phenomenally. I believe L must have been rolling in the money. He must have been it's hugely successful. It was reprinted, and the plates were reworked because mezzotint doesn't hold up that much that long. Um, and it was recommended, and still is sometimes, by drawing teachers, so that you learn to, by copying these great landscapes what to do, and it becomes you know especially good for your favorites, the, the watercolor artists. That's right. And there was a second printing. Now, this is interesting. A second print of reproductions after the Liber Veritatis were by Ludovico <clears throat> Caracciolo in Rome in 1815. That tells you something because oh. it also that falls right in the pocket when J.M.W. Turner, Mr. Turner himself, decides to come up with his Liber Studiorum, which is the Book of Studies, which was a collection of 71 of his own paintings and watercolors in landscape and he wanted them to be made into mesotints and that was being worked on between 1807 and 1819 so you can see again there's this whole Claudism you know it's this this Claude rage so with that said I'm just going to show you for instance here is the Liber Veritatis the record of seaport with Ulysses returning Christius to her father hmm. this is from Homer in case you needed to know <laughs> <laughs> so this is the actual drawing, and it appears to be on that gorgeous blue paper. And look at that oh. marvelous heightening with you know white yeah. and whatnot. Um, and then he that Boydell would give you this is the actual painting that's in the Louvre, huh. right? So it's I now I'm giving you the comparison, so you can see the Libia Veritatis rendering, and then the actual painting, huh. and how you know faithful they are. Now they're not reversed because it's. A a drawing. Small, a drawing after his mm -hmm. painting or prior to we're not quite sure right there's a one more version so a landscape with Aeneas and uh, at Delos and again I'm not sure when I was on Delos I did not see any sort of um, pantheon-esque kind of <laughs> structure there uh, uh, or even this sort of uh, Tuscan style column with this Grecian frieze situation on the right uh, I mean, this wasn't at Delos but but these little people pointing are definitely there here it is, mm. all right? Mm -hmm. and, and, oh, right on the edge of the sea. Yeah. <laughs> it sort of looks like the Griffith Conservatory, uh, Observatory, doesn't it? What do they call them in English landscapes when you come across a... a... Folly? Yes, thank you, a folly. <laughs> I could not come up with it. Well done. Well, that's exactly the same time as Boydell's doing all of this publishing of this stuff, okay? Right, so that exactly. it, it is your... English landscape your gardens creating are... creating 
you are creating Claude paintings. In your garden. And it's essentially when Versailles was being laid out, the landscape architects were creating Poussin paintings. Right. They really were. So uh, very good. Very, very good. So then you can see them side by side and you can get a sense of what he was thinking about. Um, just in terms of his own, I carry it with me book. Here's a, a his index of, of the wow. owners of the paintings. Wow. You know, so here's just the fact that th it should remind you a little bit of my editions book. Yes, it does. That kind of record keeping. Leo was really surprised when he saw like I was entering, and you got this, and I got to that, to that, to that. It's like, yeah, I keep records of all that stuff, and then who I sold it to, so that maybe I can say, hey, I've got a new thing out. Would you like to? Mm -hmm. Or maybe if you're really lucky, you have your best friend take care of that for you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So um, the the thing I wanted to show you is when Erlem gets a hold of it, um, and he creates these mesitants after the Liber Veritatis. So he's using the etched line, but then the mesitant is being used to create the values. And I will just, I'm giving you an address here because it's really kind of wonderful to be able to see, you know, it's from the original drawing in the collection of the Duke of Devonshire. And it's a perfect address that tells you this is number 114 and it was engraved by so-and-so and it's published by so-and-so that it really gives you its whole provenance. It's its birth certificate. So um, I wanted to give you those ideas so, what am I trying to tell you? Eh, I forgot what my thought is here. Oh, two drawings by the, of the same painting by him, but on some blue page, blah, blah. Okay, here's your book. <laughs> I know, you cut that. So here's the, the Liber Veritatis. Now it's finally in, pub, in print, and now everybody knows it's the Book of Truth, a collection of prints um, after original designs of Claude Le, uh, Lorraine, and it's one of those 18,000 long titles. Yes. Uh, it's a marvelously long... Um, What's the date on the publication? Yep. And I can actually spell it out for you. There's a wonderful little intro by the Duke of Devonshire. And you know, this isn't that un unlike other British collections that were putting together books of their sculptures who, that they had. Um, and then a nice little life of Claude Lorraine in, in letterpress. But I wanted to see, I wanted you to be able to see what it looked like as a book. So oh, nice. <laughs> all of this is vi uh, visible when you go to uh, the New York Public Library, it has it all online. And so the one I really wanted to look at was the number 114, which is the embarkation of the Queen of Sheba. Mm. But here we can see, you know, these portrait versions, like vertical <laughs> landscapes. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? There, Anne is laughing. Because I know. Go ahead. Why is this? I told you. <laughs> That's hilarious. I mean, it's really like you just squeezed your Photoshop. Yeah. Picture wrong. It's like, you know, you just like pulled the bottom line. It's like, no, no, no. You're supposed to control <laughs> yeah. Z and get that back to the proper proportions. Yeah, you didn't pull the corner. You pulled the side. Right. So, yeah. And it's, but he did it for real. <laughs> it's, it's because you look at the type at the oh, bottom and it's funny. Right. All right. So they're, you know, but they really are remarkable. Now these mesitants, um, we haven't talked about mesitant. I don't want to go into it too much since I know we're going to have Carol Wax on at some point. But yes. mesitent was a, a process that had been invented in, are you ready, 1642 by Ludwig von Siegen, who is a British, or excuse me, who's a German um, soldier and an amateur artist. And he wanted to, you know, come up with a way to get some shading into his images. And so initially, when mesitent was invented, you take this this tool that has a whole lot of sharp, jaggy teeth all along an edgy, rocky, rock, 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 back and forth onto the copper in the areas where you want the values. And then you burnish away anything that's supposed to go white. And so they used to work um, light. Additively. Yes, very good. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So they would just do the, the pre with correct. the rocking and leave the rest. Correct. So it would be light of, yeah. to dark. Gotcha. But by the time we get to the 1800s, they're working dark to light. So right. you, you rock the entire plate and turn it into this gorgeous black velvet, and then you pull out all of the, the lights that you want. But you can see that Boy, uh, Erlum has really done a beautiful job of, of I, I'm amazed, you know, they chose to do um, mesotint as opposed to aquatint. It had been invented, but they used mesotint because it gave a more truthful range of the wash, apparently. So there's that. And so you can just page through the book all you want. Yeah, that's great. And Thank you, New York Public Library. Indeed. And then you can look at things and say, how is that possible that that 16th century ship sailed, sailed into that very uh, classical looking port? And, Sorry. you know, basically you say, suspension of disbelief. Because number one, <laughs> you, beloved listener, don't know the difference. 
But we could get real persnickety, but we won't because it's just plain beautiful. Well, and I always think of them as um, in the same way that Turner's book was trying to lay out to you the different types of landscapes. Mm -hmm. He had them all marked as marine or mountain or, you know, pastoral or whatever Mm -hmm. and poetic. And um, in the end, I mean, Claude might have intended it for it to be something to use as a copyright proof of his mm-hmm. composition his book of truths but that they come by the time they're published they become um sample books basically. they are because they give you they give the english audience all of these marvelous examples of of you know of 200 of his sketches and they're you know to, to think that these images are on copper plates they look all the world like pen and ink sketches. They're really quite rem- remarkable. So Erlum was a, was a master at this. We actually used to pull out um, Erlum's mesotints. I, I see this smile. I said, you should have these out. And you would pull out those. The fruit piece. Yes, the ones and after the Van Heysen. Mm-hmm. And then there was that really scary Mona Lisa. It was like, whoa. Oh, yeah. Because it was bizarrely photographic, even though the guy died in 1822. Was that Erlum? Yeah. It was? Yeah. That wasn't Kalamata or somebody? Uh-uh. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. I went on one of our amazing, it's like, whoa. And the <laughs> students like, whoa. And the thing is that, that Mesotent was, it was referred to as the thing that the British really liked. So they referred to it, the French referred to it as la, la manière anglaise, yeah, right? English it's that manner. English thing. Mm-hmm. We don't do that here, but the English do. Yeah, the English did it. They loved it because they used it for all their portraits because that portrait, that big fluorescence of, of portraiture, the Gainsboroughs and the... Rayburn's in the, there's another little chapter I try to avoid a little <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, no pinky and blue boy. If some I can of them it. are good. I know, some of them are really remarkable. <laughs> Romney, yeah. But, you know, mostly, mesotint was used for reproductive engraving. It's so interesting to think about how there was, believe it or not, this mesotint craze in England. I didn't realize how a big damn dealio it was from 1760 until, bum, 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 1929. Whoa. Yeah, ka And that makes a lot of sense. You know, stock market crashes. Like, gosh, what I really need now is something to eat mm-hmm. as opposed to mesotents. Think about it also that most mesotents are going to last 100 to maybe 200 pulls. I can't even understand how you could because that would mat down so easily. Right. And they'd go back in and refresh the ground. Mm-hmm. But, and then uh, one more source just to give it to you was that, you know, mesotents sort of fell out of favor there for a little bit. But... It had this amazing upswing, resurgence in 1990 with the publication of a certain book called Mesotent History and Practice by none other than Carol Wax, Wax. <laughs> <laughs> who I use all the time uh, for you know light and shadow in my drawing classes because it's exquisite. Absolutely using that me- method for its complete abilities. So the publication of the book is in 1777 or something? Is yep. that what you said? Mm-hmm. Okay. And so that springboards a whole bunch of stuff. The Liber Veritatis has this phenomenal ripple effect across the pond even, because you know you have English landscape painting, but then you also have its impact in the United States, because the kinds of landscapes that would be produced start evoking those concepts of not just the sunny Hudson River things, but some of the issues of the sublime. And so one of the people that absolutely loved it, loved the Liber Veritatis, was none other than J.M.W. Turner. And he was born in 1775, back when that book was being made, died in 1851. But, you know, he essentially wanted to create his own manual of printmaking, of printmaking of his catalog of, of what the appropriate landscapes were. So he'd had this Liber Studiorum, the, the book of studies, of 71 of his paintings, um, watercolor and oil that are going to be made into this book and the these well it's interesting what I'm showing Anne here is that Turner now remember the Liber Veritatis was made 100 years after Claude had died right but here's Turner coming along and this is Turner who is at the time let's say 32 years old okay I'm giving Anne uh, an image of the initial plate for the five plagues of Egypt which is the wrong number but that's what he called it <laughs> Uh, and so Turner would have done the line engraving, and then he would hand that off to the mesotinters. And in this case, it was Charles Turner, no relation, who then would add the mesotint uh, rocking to it and then be able to pull all the light and shadow out, which is freaking, well, what do you think? Well, no, these mesotints are really fantastic. And, and I think we didn't JMW drove Charles Turner 
kind of crazy. Not just him, everybody. And everybody else he worked with because he, he was so exacting. On top of him. You yeah. know, he would do the etching and then he would make he was notes. not very make, nice. No, not at all. He was a very unpleasant person. Still, he supervised this thing so incredibly carefully. I mean, it was really smart. He knew he wanted to use, they, they tried aqua tint for a couple and like, no, 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 no. It's have to be, it has to be mesotint to give these incredibly rich, dark values, this whole range that you could get and have them printed in sepia inks, which is even more glorious than in just black inks. What it is is kind of this bizarre, marvelous hybrid between an original print and reproductive printmaking because you know you've got the sketch on the plate of where things are supposed to be but then the mezzotinter is having to react to the actual painting they're stunning they're absolutely rich and delicious and and marvelous and then the different kinds of landscape he wanted was historical mountainous pastoral elevated elegant or legiac that was because those are the ones that would look like Claude. Marine landscapes and architectural ones. And that was essentially Turner's whole philosophy of landscape up until he finished it in 1819. But I wanted to remind you at that time, he's only 44 years old, 1819. He paints rain, speed, and steam, the Great Western Railway. He paints that in 1844. Hmm. Those really crazy, late, wonderful ones. Mm -hmm. He's 69 years old. Right. So there's still a vast amount of time. But to just see the birth of his idea of this sublime, that absolutely cataclysmically huge kind of thing that could happen in landscape, and then would eventually bowl over into American landscape painting with the Hudson River and School and whatnot. All of that goes back to Claude. Claude, yes. Which is really remarkable. So I wanted to uh, give us one little parting quote from another Englishman, if I might. Claude's lack of interest in avoiding anachronism is perhaps seen most clearly in the ships in his harbor scenes. He's such a bitch, this writer. Very funny. So Turner and, and John Constable, two remarkable British landscape painters, here's a great way to summarize the, the idea of what Constable had to say about Claude Lorraine's work. Constable described Claude as, quote, the most perfect landscape painter the world ever saw and declared that in Claude's landscape, quote, all is lovely, all amiable, all is amenity and repose, the calm sunshine of the heart. But it's not real. That's why it's repose and calm because there's no oh such thing. Oh my goodness! What do you mean it's not? Of course it's not real. The, it's, none of those landscapes are well because in my hard. mind, la landscape <laughs> <laughs> landscapes are supposed to represent what we all see in our own worlds. That's why we like Dutch landscape, my friend. Right. That's why we don't enjoy Poussin, even though Cezanne thought it was all that in a bag of chips. I don't That's understand a whole that one. story. So. That's all I have to say for now about the Book of Truth. <laughs> and that's no lie. Oh. Sorry. Gracious. I hope that works out for y'all. It was kind of <laughs> cool. It's really messy. And there was also this thing called a Claude glass, by the way. Oh, yes. I remember the Claude glass. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. tell them. Tell them. Oh, let me see if I can remember. Um, it's a concave mirror. It looks like a, a compact, like a... Handheld mm -hmm. that you would, I think, uh, get a landscape reflected in so that it would appear to be classical and yeah. in landscape. In it was like position. smoked glass, and you would you would look into that, and it would over your shoulder, it would reflect the landscape in it, so it would give these like misty, lovely, uh -huh. you know, make it amiable and sunny, and not have all those scary edges to it. And it's it was actually named long after his death, and apparently wasn't even. Um, it didn't have anything to do with Claude Lorraine, but they named it a Claude Glass because it reminded them of his. Now, this is a big deal like about 1825. Now, think about that, you know? Just to have, like, you have your Titian red hair when you go to, you know, is is it Clairol or is it, you know, real? <laughs> you got your Claude Glass. It's gorgeous to look at these paintings, but then you realize they were a much bigger deal than any of us really realize. You have a pope that owned four of them. Yeah, that's a lot. Cardinals and all kinds of royalty for this <clears throat> unlettered man. <laughs> that's weird that he gets that label. Well, it's, it's not like he's as erudite as, well, there's some others that we know that have just been spilling forth all sure. kinds of brilliance, but... I just see a guy that's loving landscape and making up some cool stuff, like coming up with neat TV shows, sort of like the, who's that guy that came up with, like Angel, Joss Whedon, oh, who comes yeah. up with cool show after cool show after cool show, and none of it's real, but it's really engaging, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Come on, who didn't love Angel after Buffy? Oh, right, and after right, that right. was, uh, what was the one with Nathan Fillion? Ooh. Oh yeah, Firefly. Mm -hmm. And... <laughs> They're all kind of Claude Lorraining it, you know? Just I guess. make what you make, enjoy it, and uh, keep it pleasant. Yeah. 
fantasy. Okay. Basically. That's what makes me escape from my humdrum world. It's early fantasy. Sure it is. Sure. Of course the Queen of Sheba is embarking well, from this harbor right, with the 16th century ships and the <laughs> classicizing elements that some of them, they say, well, that came from a church down the street, but okay. It's like, okay, so what? We don't know that. I just know that when I show Claude Lorraine paintings on the screen, my students' eyes go, bing! Wow. And even the etchings, you can see his dazzling little free hand, you know, having fun with so. It's good. Okay, I mean, that's it. That's well, all. It's good because he's like he's the beginning of, of something that will last for a very long time. Oh, yeah. And have lots of antecedents. And, you know, I, I sort of imagine Turner like a dog coming and pissing on the tree that was just pissed on by the guy ahead of him. Absolutely. You know. Without question. Yeah. Yeah. That's the sort of image I have but, in my mind. And to be so, you know, persnickety about getting his book and in Mesitant and even better and even right. more. You, know, you just, you got to be that way. You yeah. Know? It's like it's a... For lack of a better, it's a dick swinging contest, and you know, <laughs> Turner wants to win. And it's a you, girls, girls, you're both pretty. That's the end of the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, beloved listeners. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hey, everybody, thanks for listening to this episode of Plate Mark all about Claude. I hope you liked it. Um, we're going to keep moving with History of Prince as we're able. I'm sorry it's not as consistent as it might be, but that's how life goes. Let's see. A thank you to True, as usual, for being the SME, and one to Michael Diamond for the use of his original music, and one to Dan Fury for helping me with sound issues all the way along. It's always a challenge. I don't know what the hell it is. I just don't get it. Anyway, we will see you next time.